May 28th, Daily Video Bible Reading from the Net Bible, 1 Kings chapters 9 and 10 from the Old Testament. After Solomon finished building the Lord's Temple, the Royal Palace, and all the other construction projects he had planned, the Lord appeared to Solomon a second time, in the same way he had appeared to him at Gibeon. The Lord said to him, I have answered your prayer and your request for help that you made to me. I have consecrated this temple you built by making it my permanent home. I will be constantly present there. You must serve me with integrity and sincerity, just as your father David did. Do everything I commanded and obey my rules and regulations. Then I will allow your dynasty to rule over Israel permanently, just as I promised your father David. You will not fail to have a successor on the throne of Israel. But if you or your sons ever turn away from me, fail to obey the regulations and rules I instructed you to keep, and decide to serve and worship other gods, then I will remove Israel from the land I have given them. I will abandon this temple I have consecrated with my presence, and Israel will be mocked and ridiculed among all the nations. This temple will become a heap of ruins. Everyone who passes by it will be shocked and will hiss out their scorn, saying, why did the Lord do this to this land and this temple? Others will then answer, because they abandoned the Lord their God, who led their ancestors out of Egypt. They embraced other gods whom they worshipped and served. That is why the Lord has brought all this disaster down on them. After twenty years during which Solomon built the Lord's temple and the royal palace, King Solomon gave King Hiram of Tyre twenty cities in the region of Galilee, because Hiram had supplied Solomon with cedars, evergreens, and all the gold he wanted. When Hiram went out from Tyre to inspect the cities Solomon had given him, he was not pleased with them. Hiram asked, Why did you give me these cities, my friend? He called that area the region of Cable, a name which it has retained to this day. Hiram had sent to the king 120 talents of gold. Here are the details concerning the work crews King Solomon conscripted to build the Lord's temple, his palace, the terrace, the wall of Jerusalem, and the cities of Hazor, Megiddo, and Gezer. Pharaoh, king of Egypt, had attacked and captured Gezer. He burnt it and killed the Canaanites who lived in the city. He gave it as a wedding present to his daughter, who had married Solomon. Solomon built up Gezer, Lower Beth Haran, Baalith, Tadmor in the wilderness, all the storage cities that belonged to him, and the cities where chariots and horses were kept. He built whatever he wanted in Jerusalem, Lebanon, and throughout his entire kingdom. Now several non-Israelite peoples were left in the land after the conquest of Joshua, including the Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. Their descendants remained in the land. The Israelites were unable to wipe them out completely. Solomon conscripted them for his work crews, and they continued in that role to this very day. Solomon did not assign Israelites to these work crews. The Israelites served as his soldiers, attendants, officers, charioteers, and commanders of his chariot forces. These men were also in charge of Solomon's work projects. There were a total of 550 men who supervised the workers. Solomon built the terrace as soon as Pharaoh's daughter moved up from the city of David to the palace Solomon built for her. Three times a year, Solomon offered burnt offerings and peace offerings on the altar he had built for the Lord, burning incense along with them before the Lord. He made the temple his official worship place. King Solomon also built ships in Ezion Geber, which is located near Elat in the land of Edom, on the shore of the Red Sea. Hiram sent his fleet and some of his sailors, who were well acquainted with the sea, to serve with Solomon's men. They sailed to Ophir, took from there 420 talents of gold, and then brought them to King Solomon. When the Queen of Sheba heard about Solomon, she came to challenge him with difficult questions. She arrived in Jerusalem with a great display of pomp, bringing with her camels carrying spices, a very large quantity of gold and precious gems. 
She visited Solomon and discussed with him everything that was on her mind. Solomon answered all her questions. There was no question too complex for the king. When the queen of Sheba saw for herself Solomon's extensive wisdom, the palace he had built, the food in his banquet hall, his servants and attendants, the robes, his cupbearers, and his burnt offerings, which he presented in the Lord's temple, she was amazed. She said to the king, The report I heard in my own country about your wise sayings and insight was true. I did not believe these things until I came and saw them with my own eyes. Indeed, I didn't hear even half the story. Your wisdom and wealth surpass what was reported to me. Your attendants who stand before you at all times and hear your wise sayings are truly happy. May the Lord your God be praised because he favored you by placing you on the throne of Israel. Because of the Lord's eternal love for Israel, he made you king so you could make just and right decisions. She gave the king 120 talents of gold, a very large quantity of spices, and precious gems. The quantity of spices the queen of Sheba gave King Solomon has never been matched. Hiram's fleet, which carried gold from Ophir, also brought from Ophir a very large quantity of fine timber and precious gems. With the timber, the king made supports for the Lord's temple and for the royal palace and stringed instruments for the musicians. No one has seen so much of this fine timber to this very day. King Solomon gave the queen of Sheba everything she requested, besides what he had freely offered her. Then she left and returned to her homeland with her attendants. Solomon received 666 talents of gold per year. Besides what he collected from the merchants, traders, Arabian kings, and governors of the land, King Solomon made 200 large shields of hammered gold. 600 measures of gold were used for each shield. He also made 300 small shields of hammered gold. Three minas of gold were used for each of these shields. The king placed them in the palace of the Lebanon forest. The king made a large throne decorated with ivory and overlaid it with pure gold. There were six steps leading up to the throne, and the back of it was rounded on top. The throne had two armrests with a statue of a lion standing on each side. There were twelve statues of lions on the six steps, one lion at each end of each step. There was nothing like it in any other kingdom. All of King Solomon's cups were made of gold, and all the household items in the palace of the Lebanon forest were made of pure gold. There were no silver items, for silver was not considered very valuable in Solomon's time. Along with Hiram's fleet, the king had a fleet of large merchant ships that sailed the sea. Once every three years, the fleet came into port with cargoes of gold, silver, ivory, apes, and peacocks. King Solomon was wealthier and wiser than any of the kings of the earth. Everyone in the world wanted to visit Solomon to see him display his God-given wisdom. Year after year, visitors brought their gifts, which included items of silver, items of gold, clothes, perfumes, spices, horses, and mules. Solomon accumulated chariots and horses. He had 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horses. He kept them in assigned cities and in Jerusalem. The king made silver as plentiful in Jerusalem as stones. Cedar was as plentiful as sycamore fig trees are in the lowlands. Solomon acquired his horses from Egypt and from Q. The king's traders purchased them from Q. They paid 600 silver pieces for each chariot from Egypt and 150 silver pieces for each horse. They also sold chariots and horses to all the kings of the Hittites and to the kings of Syria. God, when we talk about Solomon, most people don't talk about the amazing gift you gave him of wisdom. It's pretty rare when people connect the dots of you and your sovereignty and Solomon. In fact, I was just talking to a friend of mine tonight and he said, what are you doing? I said, I'm reading about Solomon's temple. And he says, oh, he was really rich. Not how amazing was it that God gave him. He wasn't born with that talent. You gave him that talent. Nope, the rich part. And 
you can even see in the list that the Queen of Sheba gives, everything is about material possessions, even, even having to do with the burnt offerings in the Lord's temple. It was still all about what you were offering, not the fact that it, they were offering it to you. So everybody was starting to be very blinded by his wisdom, by his wealth. And I think we're easily starting to see Solomon start to buy into his own uh, PR. Um, he's definitely making it all about him, not only with his own temple, his own house, uh, but choosing a wife that he knows you don't want him to choose. Uh, we're about to learn that there's quite a few more of those love interests that, that you would never have <laughs> approved of. Um, he's starting to buy into all the hype around him and his ego is starting to be bigger than you God than who you should be in his life and, and we're about to see disaster happen again um, because we make it about us instead of making it about you God today I just pray that I just pray that we go through today thinking about John 330 that you must become greater we must become less you must become greater. We must become less. It truly is, at least for me, that tipping point in our relationship with you. To me, it's kind of the, the balancing point for the entire Bible and everything you want us to get. Because once we understand how to put ourselves second or 32nd and put everyone else in front of us and put you first and foremost in our lives, kind of everything else you taught us to do in the Bible falls into place. Loving you with everything that we have can only happen if we take second place. Loving our neighbor as ourselves only happens if we're second place. I think if we go today and read John 3.30 and really concentrate on those words, it's such a short verse, something really easy, something you could write down maybe... Uh, write it down on a book you carry around or put it in your car or maybe uh, put it on your phone or on the on the case of your phone um, just write it down someplace and and god i just pray that the people who write these things down today that you must become greater i must become less uh, that it's just really intentional today that in all their decision making it's always about you it's not about them it's not about their ego it's not about them taking it personal it's always about you and what decision would you have made at that particular moment. You know, my heart is, my heart is breaking right now because I just saw a post on, um, in fact, I saw a couple of them on Facebook from, from friends who are Christian. Yet in the post, and it's two different people making fun of two different other people, they're actually making fun of somebody else for being less than they are or what they deem as less than they are. Um, and again, if, if we are putting you first, God, there's a humbleness that has to come into our, our world. It has to come into our heart. When we understand that you are first and we are second, then we start to see everything else through your heart rather than our heart. There's nobody out there that is less important than we are there are people that need to be called out in righteous anger that's a totally different thing but there's nobody out there that deserves to be made fun of or to be thought less of it's very much where the world starts to think of us as hypocritical uh, christians do as we say not as we do type of thing and i have no doubt i'm just as guilty as anybody else so god please help us be intentional today how, help us as soon as we're done listening to this, write down John 3.30, go and look it up in our Bibles, um, pull it up on our phones, and then have us write it down someplace today so that we can see it at all times. So that we understand why it's so important for you to become greater and for us to become less. Because once our ego becomes involved in this world, everything falls apart. Our choices are horrid, our decisions are bad, um, we hurt relationships, we hurt our relationship with you, we hurt the potential for other people hearing about you. It it just becomes a mess. And we're actually going to see this obviously unfold with Solomon as 
he makes it all about him rather than all about you. The wisest man in the world, and he still can't get that right. It's something we always struggle with, God. We want to make ourselves the most important thing in our kingdom instead of you. So today, God, today, God, I am removing me, removing me from the throne of my heart, and I am putting you on the throne of my heart. You are in charge today. Hopefully you are in charge all days, but today, very intentional. You are in charge. You are greater. I will be less. In your son's name I pray. Amen.